Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our third webinar in the Gervais Syndrome Foundation's Listen and Learn educational series. We'd like to take a moment to thank our educational sponsors who made this series possible, which include Greenwich Biosciences, Norellis, Zogenics, Encoded Therapeutics, Stoke Therapeutics. We would also like to thank the American Epilepsy Society for their partnership with DSF to provide CME accreditation for this series. We'll be sending emails following the session today with instructions for claiming credit if you need it. Um, lastly, if you registered for this series, you should have received a link to a survey to assess your baseline knowledge of Gervais syndrome prior to watching any of the webinars. And I just would like to ask you to watch out for a follow-up survey that will come after November 16th when the series wraps to determine um, if this series has impacted your knowledge of Gervais syndrome. Um, and then lastly, I just want to let you know that there'll be time for questions at the end. If you would like to drop questions into the chat, we can read those to Dr. Whirl at the end, or you're also welcome to use your video audio to ask a question yourself at the end. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Elaine Whirl, who's our speaker today. She's the Director of Pediatric Epilepsy and a Professor of Neurology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. She completed her medical training at the University of British Columbia and her pediatric neurology training at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She's the co-chair of the Nosology and Status Epilepticus Task Force and a member of the Psychiatric Issues and Pediatric Epilepsy Task Force of the International League Against Epilepsy. She's also the chair of the Pediatric Content Committee at the American Epilepsy Society and a member of the Medical Advisory Board for the Duray Syndrome Foundation. Her main research interests are in early onset medically intractable epilepsies and epileptic encephalopathies. Today, she'll be discussing status epilepticus. Thank you, Dr. Whirl, for being here today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation to, uh, to speak. And so um, I'm going to be um, uh, discussing status epilepticus in Dravet syndrome, which, um, as uh, most of you know, who manage patients with Dravet syndrome is a very significant uh, concern in this population. And we will look at emergency medicines as well as uh, seizure response plans. So here are my disclosures. And the objectives for the talk today are, first of all, to review the different types of status epilepticus, to understand the risks of status epilepticus in Dravet syndrome, and to identify which patients um, with Dravet syndrome are most at risk of status epilepticus. We then want to understand the role of rescue therapies in preventing status epilepticus and um, also the importance of a seizure action plan. And then um, we will address a little bit about um, uh, what we know about treatment of status epilepticus in the hospital. So if the rescue medicines have not worked. So just to um, review status epilepticus and review the definition. So I think the, um, the definition, the traditional definition of status epilepticus has been um, a seizure or recurrent seizures without return to cognitive baseline lasting longer than 30 minutes. And so that's the actual traditional definition of status epilepticus. But we all know that we want to really prevent that from happening. And so we need an operational definition. So something that we can actually look at and say, this means this person is at high risk of going on to develop um, status epilepticus or impending status epilepticus. And here the, uh, the operational definition, as most of you know, has been um, uh, longer than five minutes. So a single seizure, um, convulsive seizure lasting longer than five minutes, or recurrent seizures without return to cognitive baseline lasting longer than five minutes. We also use a couple of other terms when we um, uh, discuss status epilepticus. So refractory status epilepticus means that the uh, patient has failed an adequately dosed benzodiazepine, as well as one additional second line anti-seizure medicine. And then we use the term super refractory status epilepticus to describe status epilepticus that continues beyond 24 hours requiring coma induction or somebody who has status epilepticus that recurs after um, coming out of coma. So that's super refractory status epilepticus. 
And we also know that um, seizures are somewhat different. So the impact of convulsive status epilepticus is um, felt to be a little bit different than generalized non-convulsive status or focal impaired aware or focal motor status. So the International League Against Epilepsy Task Force on classification of, of status epilepticus um, looked at the different types of, of status epilepticus and then identified two time points. So T1 is the time that we want emergency treatment starting. So this is um, a time when if that patient has been seizing for this long, the likelihood is quite high that they will go on and develop status epilepticus if we do not intervene. And then T2 is the time at which long-term sequelae can sometimes be seen or can be expected. And so you can see here with tonic-clonic um, status epilepticus, that is the one of most concern. So we want to start treating that at five minutes. And um, we, we are concerned if that is lasting longer than 30 minutes. For focal impaired awareness seizures where there's not convulsive activity, the T1 is 10 minutes and the T2 is somewhere beyond 60 minutes. And for absent status epilepticus, um, there's less evidence. So maybe between 10 and 15 minutes where we would jump in and treat. And we really don't know how long that goes on before we start to see long-term consequences. So why do we worry about status epilepticus? I think many of us are concerned that prolonged status epilepticus or prolonged seizures can actually result in brain injury, further brain injury. And there have been now quite a number of studies from children who are in the ICU with status epilepticus that have correlated an increased seizure burden, and that's based on EEG seizure burden because many of these patients are intubated and paralyzed, um, but they've correlated an increased seizure burden with poor outcome. However, many of these children in the ICU have status epilepticus because they have sustained an acute brain injury. And so if we look, um, we see that brain injury certainly can lead to seizures, but we also know that brain injury in and of itself um, can result in, in um, uh, neurological disability. And so not surprisingly, if you have a more severe brain injury, you might have more severe seizures. And so you can expect more neurological disability. And I think what we really are interested in in Dravet syndrome, where most of the patients, this is not an acute you know, neurological injury that's happened, this is part of their disease, is what is the relationship here between seizures and disability? So looking at the secondary injury. We also know that rapid treatment of seizures doesn't necessarily actually improve long-term clinical outcomes. And I think that the bottom line here is that cause is important. We certainly are more concerned with somebody who's had an acute symptomatic seizure um, as, uh, uh, as, as potentially uh, then having ongoing um, uh, brain injury. We also know that um, treating status epilepticus is not always benign. So there are complications of the treatment. Many children um, in status epilepticus who need to be placed into coma, particularly barbiturate coma, will need pressor agents. They have issues with hypotension. Infection is a, certainly uh, a risk in our patients, particularly those who are placed into coma. Um, about two thirds of children um, treated with pentobarbital coma will develop infections and pneumonia is the, uh, the most common one that we see. And we know that in these children, sepsis significantly increases the risk of in-hospital death with an odds ratio of over 10. So infection is probably one of the biggest concerns that we worry about in children that we're putting into coma. Metabolic acidosis um, can also be a result of some medicines as well as ongoing hypotension. And then there are respiratory issues, problems with aspiration, with hypoxemia, and particularly with prolonged ventilation, barotrauma. And then a concern about um, rhabdomyolysis that can affect kidney function. We can see hepatic injury from some of our medications. We can see dress. We can see pancreatitis, particularly in those on uh, pentobarbital infusions. So the treatment of status epilepticus also is not completely benign. Now, when we look at the outcome of super refractory status epilepticus, so these are patients who actually require um, a coma and then their, uh, their seizures or their status recurs once that is lifted, um, the mortality here is quite high between 30 and 50%. But here, the most important factor um, uh, uh, that, that um, places one at increased risk of mortality is the underlying cause. So again, it's those that have acute brain injuries that do worse. <clears throat> 
And why do people die um, from super refractory status? Well, there are the major medical complications that we have just addressed. And as well, there are some um, uh, patients where there is withdrawal of, of intensive care support if it's deemed that the brain injury is very, very severe. We know that morbidity is also high in survivors of super refractory status epilepticus. And again, cause is very important here. So many of these patients are left with motor deficits, cognitive deficits, as well as intractable epilepsy. And usually we think of young brains being kind of protected, and that's probably not the case in super refractory status. They may be at higher risk of adverse outcomes. So what are the risks of status epilepticus in Dravet syndrome? Um, this um, uh, was a small uh, case series of three patients that was reported by the French group back in 2010. And these children all had Dravet syndrome. They were all quite young between 13 and 38 months when they presented. And they presented with febrile status epilepticus um, as is common for Dravet syndrome. And the status lasted quite long between two and 12 hours. And then when they looked at the um, imaging on these children in the acute period, what they saw was widespread brain changes that suggested ischemia or hypoxia. And there was not really any clear evidence that those patients had had significant hypotension or had had significant um, hypoxemia during their course of status. So this was kind of a very, very concerning uh, imaging findings without a clear clinical explanation for that. And the thoughts initially was that this may be due to high dose barbiturates. This was a group out of uh, France and um, uh, all of these patients were on steripental and we know that steripental has a lot of drug-drug interactions and the thoughts were that maybe with the barbiturates this really drove up barbiturate le levels and maybe that was the reason um, why these changes were, were seen, but certainly concerning. And this has now been, I think, fairly well recognized, this acute encephalopathy after status epilepticus and Dravet syndrome. Um, it affects um, anywhere between 3.3 and 7.6% of patients um, in the um, uh, case series that have been uh, published. It most commonly affects younger children, but again, those are the children that also tend to be at higher risk of prolonged status epilepticus. Nearly all of the children were febrile at the onset of their status epilepticus. And then it's really immediately followed by coma. So these kids come in in status, it's treated and they simply don't wake up. And there's very high morbidity as well as high mortality. The MRI acutely shows marked brain swelling, marked cerebral edema. Um, and you can often see um, changes on the uh, DWI imaging in the cortex, the deep gray, deep gray matter, as well as um, the subcortical white matter. And chronically, um, after several months, if you re-image these children, um, if they survive, they do progress to, to severe brain atrophy. And it's now felt that this is probably related somehow to the SCN1A channelopathy, that that predisposes to such swelling. What we don't know is why it happens in you know, that one case when children have several or, or multiple bouts of status epilepticus and why it happens just in some children and not other children. We don't know those, the answers to that, but, but we think this is a, a, a problem with the SCN1A channelopathy that predisposes to this. And there have now been uh, three larger um, uh, case series that have been reported looking at this problem in Dravet syndrome. So uh, one publication out of Japan looking at 15 individuals. You can see here, again, most of the individuals are quite young with a mean of 44 months. Um, the status epilepticus lasted anywhere from 40 minutes to five hours. All of the patients had fever at onset. And looking at the outcome, they had a quarter of those patients die. They had 60% who were left severely disabled and 13% moderately disabled. A smaller group by Myers et al, again, between 10 months and 11 years. Again, all of them were febrile. All of them had status epilepticus. And in this group, all of them died. And then a study that was published um, out of China looking at 35 individuals with Dravet syndrome. Again, a mean age of three and a half years at the time of presentation. 34 of 35 had fever. And again, a third of those patients died. And in survivors, all of them had quite marked uh, disability. And so here's some imaging studies from those papers. The first is the one by Myers. This is a, a patient who presented, this is the um, initial day of presentation. And then uh, this is about four or five days later and you can see marked cerebral edema. You can actually see brainstem herniation and compression of the cord. And 
This is a study from uh, Japan, and these are a number of different patients that they looked at. And so you can see here um, in uh, this um, uh, uh, picture here, um, over here, over here, over here, we see uh, marked changes in the uh, cortex. We also see changes in the cerebellum. And additionally, we see changes in the thalami here and in the um, uh, caudate and the lentiform nuclei here, as well as in the subcortical white matter. And these are all quite extensive changes. And then this final one is um, uh, from uh, the Chinese study. And this is uh, acutely, we see evidence of marked swelling of the uh, right cerebral hemisphere. And then looking more chronically, we see evidence really of bilateral atrophy more on the right than the left. Um, and as well, we see significant still uh, the subcortical uh, signal changes. So these are very, very prominent imaging findings that we see in this uh, group of patients. So what do we know about risk of status epilepticus and Dravet syndrome? I think um, everybody understands that while all patients with Dravet syndrome um, are at potential risk of status epilepticus, and so all of them do need uh, a rescue therapy and a seizure action plan, we know that that risk is certainly highest in the young children, particularly less than five years of age. And typically we see the risk of status decreasing in frequency over later childhood and adolescence, and it actually becomes quite rare in, in adulthood. Most of the patients in adulthood, adulthood are having more of the brief um, generalized seizures often in sleep. So a lower risk, but not a no risk of status. So can status epilepticus be prevented? And I wish I had an, a yes answer here, but um, the answer is really no. Um, However, I think we can do things to try and reduce the risk of that. So what that means is all persons with Dravet syndrome need a home rescue medication, and all persons need a rescue plan to outline treatment if the home rescue medication doesn't work. Remember, a lot of these patients are not living next door to a pediatric um, uh, uh, epilepsy center. Many of these patients are living um, closer to uh, small community hospitals and uh, individuals in these hospitals probably don't have the experience that is really needed to know how to best manage these, these very challenging patients. So a home rescue medication, as well as a seizure action plan to be followed if the home rescue medication doesn't work. Work. And why is this important? And that's um, uh, from data from the Pediatric Status Epilepti Epilepticus Research Group that looked at what is the time from seizure onset in children to the time they actually get an anti-seizure medication. And the bottom line is it's very, very delayed. So they looked at 81 children with a median age of three and a half years. And shown here in this figure is the, um, the time, the cumulative uh, probability of having received medication. And so you're looking at the 50% mark here. And this is the time from seizure onset until the medication is administered. This green is for the first medication. The blue is for patients uh, who needed a second anti-seizure medicine. And red is for patients who needed a third medication. And you can see here that the time to get the first medicine is 28 minutes after the seizure starts. So it's really important um, to know that, that the, the, the people working in the ERs know the child is coming in, know to be ready for them and know what to give. The time for the second medicine was 40 minutes and for the third medicine, 59 minutes. So let's talk a little bit about some FDA approved as well as non-approved options that we can use um, for home rescue medications. So I think everybody is aware of diazepam rectal gel. This is actually FDA approved for children two years and older, but I must say frequently we're using it for younger children. I'm a bit anxious using it for children less than six months, but um, uh, certainly for, for older children, we do use this. Um, it is, um, the dose is preset by the pharmacy and the, the doses range anywhere from 2.5 milligrams all the way up to 20 milligrams. And it depends on the patient's weight. I think um, the, um, the diazepam rectal gel is most appropriate for young patients. And if it's used in older patients, it's really most appropriate if given in the privacy of their own home. It is less appropriate for use in, in older kids, particularly in public settings. And that's because you have to disrobe the patient from the waist down in order to administer that. So we have a couple of newly approved medications for status epilepticus that um, have just been approved by the FDA this year. The first is nasal diazepam, and it's now FDA approved for people six years and older. 
And it comes in this uh, fairly easy to uh, administer um, device. This part here goes up into a nostril and this is the plunger that you push. Um, this is pre-dosed in single use devices and the devices are five milligrams, 7.5 milligrams or 10 milligrams. And because it's actually pre-dosed and all you have to do is put this device up into a nostril and push the plunger, it's easily given by a lay person. So it could be given by a teacher, it can be given by somebody on the school bus. And because you don't have to disrobe the patient to give it, it's also, I think, very appropriate for use in more of a public setting. These devices are, however, quite costly and not all, not all insurances are covering them. And then similarly, uh, a very similar looking device, as you can see here, is um, uh, nasal midazolam. And again, it's the same thing. You put this up one nostril and you push the plunger. This is FDA approved for persons 12 years and older. And it's available as a single use device and the dose is five milligrams. And again, very similar to the uh, nasal diazepam, easily given by a lay person. And um, I think quite appropriate for use in a public setting in older individuals and quite efficacious. So we also have quite a number of non-FDA approved options that are still, I think, um, uh, quite widely used and seem to be um, uh, quite effective. So for younger children, um, we often are using diazepam or lorazepam oral solution. It's called Intensol, and it comes in a small bottle like this. Uh, the bottle typically is good for about three months after you open it. And uh, it comes with a small little syringe, and you can see the markings on the syringe. And so what you have to do is you actually draw up that liquid and you give it buccally during a seizure. And the volume usually, it depends on the, the weight of the child, but usually between one and two ml, so it's not a large volume. Um, it certainly can be given by lay individuals, but it does require that the person who gives the dose have to drop the, the correct amount of medication, so you have to trust that the person is going to do that. Um, diazepam and tensile is actually stable at room temperature, but lorazepam is not, and it needs to be kept refrigerated. And so um, depending, you know, if there's a fridge in the classroom or not, that could also delay administration. But they, these are um, uh, options that are commonly used. And then there's clonazepam, ODTs, or oral disintegrating tablets. Um, these are also pre-dosed in quite a range of doses between 0.125 milligrams all the way up to 2 milligrams. Um, and these are placed again into the buccal cavity. They're very rapidly um, uh, absorbed that way. Um, and again, it seems reasonable to use these um, by lay individuals um, because you're just having to give the tablet. You're not having to you know, drop anything. So I think there's less room for error in that regard. And then before we had um, the official nasal midazolam called nasolam, uh, we often would use uh, nasal midazolam and that was the intravenous uh, form. We, so we had a vial, an inter, a vial of, of intravenous um, uh, midazolam and that would be drawn up into a syringe. Uh, we drop a specific volume of that. And then we would place this device called a nasal atomizer at the end of the syringe. And what that basically does is it atomizes the solution and this would be placed into a nostril and you would administer it that way. So it's the same medication as um, the new form of nasal midazolam. It's just a little bit more challenging at times to draw up. So looking at the dosing of these medications, um, this was a paper by a study that was um, done by Wallace and colleagues and it looked at, it was a survey of um, uh, child neurologists and pediatric epileptologists across the US and it looked at doses. And you can see here for the different um, uh, varieties of medication and the different routes, you can see the doses that are actually given. Uh, and again, those are depending on age and depending on weight. And specifically in Dravet syndrome, when do we administer rescue medication? And this was um, a study that again we did, it was a, um, um, a study of um, uh, what, we, what we considered uh, uh, pediatric epilepsy experts across the US and Canada. And we also included uh, a number of families who were quite active in the Dravet syndrome foundation group who had um, expertise not only on their own child, but also uh, many other children. And we asked, you know, what is the appropriate treatment for Dravet syndrome? And one of the things we looked at is, is managing status and, uh, and giving rescue medication. And the, the consensus was that in a patient whose seizures are often self-limiting, um, that it would be reasonable if they had a convulsive seizure to wait three to five minutes to give the rescue medication, because oftentimes those seizures will stop on their own and you may not need a rescue medication. 
However, we also know that in Dravet syndrome, and particularly in younger children with Dravet syndrome, there are some children who, you know, pretty much when they start having a convulsive seizure, that seizure is going to last and that seizure is going to evolve to prolong status epilepticus. And so if you're in that situation, it doesn't make sense to wait three to five minutes. If you're in that situation, the rescue medication is given pretty much at seizure onset. There was also consensus that rescue medication should be given for clusters of convulsive seizures, and this can be seen again in Dravet syndrome, but there was not a lot of consensus for the use of rescue medication with clusters of non-convulsive seizures. So looking at the ER and hospital management, um, you know, hopefully if we're giving these rescue medications earlier, we can avoid many of these hospitalizations and many of these ER visits, but not always. And the issue here is there's not been really good studies on what is the best way to treat status epilepticus that has not responded to rescue medication in individuals with Dravet syndrome. And I think what I've learned from treating kind of a number of these uh, patients is that there's really not sort of a one um, cookie cutter approach that's going to, to go with all patients. I think we have to individualize to each patient. Um, oftentimes, unfortunately, we have a fair bit of experience with status epilepticus in each patient. And so we know um, what has worked and we know what has not worked in the past. And so to formulate um, a, a seizure action plan or seizure rescue plan um, together with the neurologist who's most familiar with that patient, as well as input from the family really taking into account what has or has not worked before. And so uh, we recommend that each patient has a written plan that they would share with medical professionals. We often advise that that be housed um, uh, in the medical chart in their closest emergency room. And that way the family can simply call in and say, Johnny is coming in, they've had two doses of whatever that hasn't worked and they're still seizing. And so the emergency room is actually ready for that patient and knows what to do when they come through the door. So looking at um, what medicines work uh, for um, hospital-based treatment of status epilepticus, there was strong consensus that um, uh, despite being given typically a benzodiazepine at home, uh, that most of the recommendations would be that patients would get another dose of IV benzodiazepine, and you may even repeat that dose once. So a good dose of benzodiazepine. There was also consensus that one um, could certainly consider an IV valproate load. The issue though is that many of our patients are already on valproic acid at high levels. And so if you have somebody who is on valproic acid with a level of 110 already, um, you probably are not going to get much much more um, effect from giving IV valproate and certainly you may have you know, significant side effects. And there's really no consensus on what the next option should be. So what do we know about um, status epilepticus? So I think one important factor is the importance of treating it early. So this was work by Goodkin and, uh, and Kapoor, and they looked at um, internalization of the GABA-A receptors um, with status epilepticus. And here's a diagram from that paper. So we see these GABA-A receptors on the surface in green, the internalized ones in red, and then this is a superimposition here. And you can see here longer duration of, of seizure. Um, going from zero minutes uh, uh, up to about 30 minutes here. And you can see here that very, very early, we're starting to see internalization of those GABA receptors. And so what that means is that if we wait too long, we're probably not going to get as much effect from benzodiazepines as we would have earlier. And so we need to administer benzodiazepines very quickly. Um, again, work from the um, pediatric status epilepsy a uh, research group showed that among children who had refractory status epilepticus, um, late administration of first-line benzodiazepines was actually associated with longer duration of the convulsion, with um, an increased use of um, uh, continuous infusions. And you can see here, they looked at um, uh, the timing less than 10 minutes after seizure onset versus longer, greater than 10 minutes after seizure onset. These are the proportions who did not require a continuous infusion. And then you can see here, those treated later, which is the light blue, had a higher chance of requiring a continuous infusion. They also found increased rates of hypotension with late use. And again, that might be because of the continuous infusion or the need for, uh, for coma. 
And then in addition, they did find some evidence of higher mortality. So uh, this is looking at outcomes, again, the early treatment, and then the light blue is the later treatment. And you can see here um, a slightly poor outcome, a higher mortality in those who were treated late. So there has been some guidelines for the treatment of convulsive status epilepticus, and I direct you to this article. The second line medication for children is a bit unclear. Uh, many people are using levetiracetam. If you're using levetiracetam, you need to use the appropriate dose, and that's about 60 milligrams per kilogram. Um, you can also look at valproic acid, but again, many of our patients with um, Dravet syndrome are already on valproic acid at pretty good blood levels. Other alternatives that could be considered would include lecosamide um, or phenobarbital. And again, phenobarbital, um, some concern that maybe that increases the risk of that, um, that very uh, poor outcome with the um, uh, diffuse um, hypoxic ischemic changes, but I am not sure about that. And then the question of phosphenitoin often comes up. We all know that um, generally we do not want to use sodium channel agents in patients with Dravet syndrome on a prophylactic basis. And the question, is that really also true for patients who come in in status epilepticus? So the question is, should phosphenitoin be used for status epilepticus and Dravet syndrome? So this was a question that we actually asked on our North American consensus of the expert clinicians as well as the expert families. And amongst physicians, there was really no consensus. So we asked um, uh, the physicians to rate this as a preferred versus a non-preferred choice for status epilepticus. Seven of 13 physicians rated it as preferred, four of 13 as non-preferred. So it looks like some, you know, certainly um, at least half of the people are potentially using this. Most of the families actually rated this as a non-preferred uh, choice. I think it depends on the patient. So I, I certainly have some patients uh, with um, uh, Dravet syndrome who have had phenytoin given with status epilepticus and for the occasional patient, that's really what brings them out of it. So I think, you know, in that situation, you wanna put it in the rescue plan. And if it's already been tried once or twice and it really hasn't done anything, then probably you'd want to go look at other options. So this was another um, uh, survey that was um, sent to a number of epilepsy specialists in Japan. And they looked at, um, uh, they asked the, the, the clinicians um, uh, how they felt various treatments worked for status epilepticus in 99 children with Dravet syndrome. So this was a survey. And you can see here the different uh, treatments. So diazepam, midazolam, phenytoin, lidocaine, and thiopental. And clinicians were asked to rank these as excellent, meaning that they usually stop the status epilepticus in Dravet patients as moderate. Sometimes they stop the status epilepticus and as poor, they usually didn't stop status epilepticus. And so you can see here generally pretty good effects with uh, benzodiazepines. And then if you have to go with, um, with thiopental, um, but again, some concern maybe with the sodium channel agents that they often do not work very well or sometimes potentially might even worsen. So I think we want to use these with caution, but again, individualize that to each child. So looking at third line, the evidence here is, um, is, is pretty lacking in children. This is a nice article that actually looked at um, uh, different treatments for um, status epilepticus in children. Uh, it's a little old, but it's actually um, got quite good information. So the bottom line is um, we use third line after first and second line therapies have failed. Usually most people are using high dose midazolam. Some people are going with barbiturate anesthesia, and then one could also consider ketamine or isofluorine, but that's usually used after. And then a child who is uh, getting third line, they're typically in the ICU. Most of them are on continuous EEG, and we're really using the EEG to help guide um, uh, titration of the, uh, of the medication. Um, this is a, an article that talked about the use of ketamine in refractory status, and, and potentially that can be an option as well. So looking at midazolam infusion, this is typically what we start with. Um, and overall, it's quite successful. In probably about three quarters of patients, we see um, seizure control after a mean time of about 41 minutes. 
Um, the nice thing about midazolam is it's very, very rarely associated with hypotension. So most of the patients do not need any type of pressor support. Uh, typically, this is uh, the doses. You see, so you're, you're giving 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, and then you're starting your infusion. You're reassessing in 10 minutes. If the seizure stops, you keep your infusion. If not, you rebolus and you go up again. And then you continue to do that every 10 minutes. And then if you get to a midazolam rate of 1.6 milligrams per kilogram per hour, then typically you move on to something else. It's not going to work very well. Another option is barbiturate anesthesia. Um, most often this is being used as a second line, so after failure of midazolam infusion. And here about two thirds of patients can achieve seizure control. Um, this has a much higher rate of hypotension and the need for pressor support. And so that's one concern. Also uh, barbiturate anesthesia. Um, if you have a patient on barbiturates for um, 24 hours or so, it's a long time to wake them up even if you after you turn this off. So you have a patient who's going to be in coma for a longer period of time. And so because of those, I think most people are using uh, midazolam first. And so when you're using pentobarbital, typically you're giving a bolus between five and 10 milligrams per kilogram, starting your infusion, and then reassessing again um, after 30 minutes, and you're increasing your titration, you're giving a little bit more of a bolus um, until you actually get into a burst suppression pattern. So other agents that have been used is uh, ketamine. Ketamine is an NMDA antagonist. Um, there have been a number of small case uh, uh, studies that are case um, series that have suggested benefit in children. Um, it also has very little impact on heart function and there's um, thoughts that it might be neuroprotective as well, which could be helpful if you're treating status epilepticus. Um, propofol also has been used. Um, we are very cautious about the use of propofol infusions in children uh, because of the risk of propofol infusion syndrome, which is often fatal. But I have had a number of children with um, Dravet syndrome where um, if we give a single dose of propofol in the ER, it's very, very effective to stop the status and they actually don't need the infusion. So it's a generally a safe thing to, to utilize. Uh, some of those patients don't even need intubation. You can kind of bag them through it and, and then they recover quite nicely. So again, that's kind of you know, part of the individualizing the, the treatment for status based on, on the patient. And then there's some anecdotal evidence only for the following treatments. I'm not going to discuss those in, in any uh, detail. So how about non-convulsive status? And the term that we often use for that in, um, in Dravet syndrome is obtundation status. And again, there's no clear consensus what treatment is best. Most of the people are starting with benzodiazepines in that situation. So this is just a child who is having back-to-back um, -back, uh, atypical absences or focal um, uh, seizures uh, uh, with uh, impaired awareness. Um, so typically benzodiazepines. And then second line, one can try levetiracetam or valproate. So to conclude, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so we really advocate strongly having a home rescue medication. And we advocate uh, strongly that the patient has a, um, a seizure action plan that should clearly delineate what um, seizure should be rescued. So how long the seizure, the type of seizure, um, what dose of what medication, can a second dose of that same medication be given? and how long to wait after that medication before 911 is called? Are there other situations where you want to call 911 earlier? So all of that information should be housed in the, uh, in the rescue um, uh, plan. Um, for, um, uh, for kids with, uh, with Dravet syndrome, so status epilepticus occasionally can have very severe outcomes um, with evidence of what looks to be a diffuse hypoxic ischemic injury, really in the absence of clear significant hypotension or hypoxemia. And it's felt that this is somehow a combination effect of the SCN1A channelopathy with fever and inflammation and prolonged status. But again, why it occurs in that one seizure and you know, children may have had five or six other prolonged seizures with, with uh, fever in the past and not had this, we don't understand that. So hospital management, early benzodiazepines, and if that fails, typically levetiracetam or valproic acid. And then if that fails, midazolam infusion. But important to remember to individualize. So what works for, for one patient may not work for the next patient. Um, so we learn from our mistakes, what 
doesn't work and we want to take that off. And then some children have very unique plans that work well for them, like my couple of kids where propofol is given as a single dose in the ER and that seems to, to stop the seizures. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elaine. Um, we had one question pop into the chat already um, asking, do you have any preference between diazepam and midazolam in rescue because of the half-life differences between the two medications? So not really for Dravet syndrome. So it would be, so most kids with Dravet syndrome don't, you know, once you stop the seizure, it doesn't pop back up again. Um, and that's unlike children who have had, you know, acute symptomatic injury to their brain where they often actually will have recurrence of seizures. So for Dravet, I think that's less of an issue. Good question though. And I actually had a question. I was curious, you know, in that graph where you showed such a delay to first, second line treatments being applied. Um, do you think that the biggest hindrance to that happening is not having a pre-worked out um, emergency action plan? Or do you think there's anything else that could be done to help improve the, the timeline of treatment? Yeah, so I think again, recognizing status epilepticus that this is a medical emergency. And so really being on top of it when the patient comes through the ER doors, many of those patients actually, uh, worryingly enough, were from um, pediatric uh, centers in, in pediatric hospitals. So I think that, you know, we as neurologists and, and we as parents are very, um, you know, if children who have recurrent status are very aware of the importance of this. But if you have a general pediatrician, um, they may not recognize quickly, you know, how important it is to get this stopped. And they may, you know, need to go look things up. And so if you actually have a, a protocol in place, you know, anybody can follow a protocol, right? And people like that, they, that gives them reassurance. So, you know, here's the protocol. This is what's worked in the past. Thank you. You know, I'm used to managing a lot of things, but status is not one of them. And so I think that really helps, you know, grease the wheels and get the, the treatment going much quicker. Great, great. I know that's been a big effort for DXF recently is trying to make sure all patients have this in place already. Does anyone else have any additional questions for Dr. Whirl? Um, if not, I do wanna quickly just make an announcement that Gervais Syndrome now has um, live ICD-10 codes. Um, so I just have them pulled up here on the screen, um, G40.83 for Dravet syndrome, and then either intractable with status epilepticus or intractable without status epilepticus. Um, we're really excited that these codes just um, became live in the new current edition October 1st. And so we're hoping that um, clinicians will start using them and we wanna increase patient awareness as well to make sure they're telling their clinicians. And Veronica, do you know if these are going to be in EPIC or they are in, in EPIC or some of the big um, medical record systems people are using? So what we've been hearing is that it seems to be variable dependent on the institute as to whether the system's been updated. Um, so we've the guidance that we've been told is that we should assume that everyone will have it by January. Um, but that some systems have already updated and it's in there and certainly clinicians can always uh, manually enter it right now. So definitely by the new year, we should have everyone able to have access to these to use them. That's great. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, we're, we're very excited for this. Um, I would love to thank Dr. Whirl for her talk today. Um, this will be uh, available on demand as well for the next year. You can still receive CME credit for participating. Um, we still have four more talks in this Listen and Learn series. So we hope that everyone will join us for the rest of those um, and be looking for emails from DSF um, with information of how to claim credit for CME for this, um, this webinar, as well as like I mentioned before, the follow-up survey about um, your knowledge of Gervais syndrome. And uh, thank you everyone for attending today.